continue. Remember that the first religion in the world was the religion of the worship of the heavens. And man eventually came to recognize the sun as the representation of the power and the ability of the hidden God of the universe, the invisible God of the universe, the all-powerful creator of everything. But man, as he gained his intellectual ability, began to look toward himself, toward the intellect, as that God and the Son, the representation of what used to be the invisible God of the universe, then became the representation of the intellect, the light, Lucifer. And man began to worship the Luciferian philosophy. He believed, these people who call themselves the guardians of the secrets of the ages, and still believe that man was held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, vindictive, and very cruel God the God of the Bible, and that he was set free from the bonds of ignorance through the gift of intellect given to him by Lucifer through his agent, Satan. Now, many people believe that Lucifer and Satan are the same individual entity, and they may be. I don't know the answer to that. I just know what the mystery schools believe, and I know what I personally believe, and what I personally believe doesn't have any bearing on anything. Knowledge, the truth, is what counts. And that's what we're trying to get to the bottom of here. Now, eventually, this philosophy of worshiping, worshiping the intellect, or wisdom, or the mind, became known as Gnosticism. And the followers of Gnosticism began to be known as the Gnostics. An extraordinary number, folks, of exceedingly bizarre talismans and inscribed stones bear witness to the power of the secret Gnostic organizations, which flourished in various forms during the few centuries immediately before and after the rise of Christianity in the Middle East. You see, one of the oddest emblems of these schools was the figure of Abraxas, now, that's a human body clothed in a Roman soldier's garb, wielding a battle axe as if threatening an enemy. Now, in its left hand, it carried an elliptical shield upon which the words of power IAO and Saboeth were sometimes written. The head of this fearsome being was that of a cock with open beak. Now, that symbolized the rising of the morning sun because the cock crows with the sunrise. For legs that had twin serpents, the serpent throughout history has always been a symbol for wisdom, the gift of intellect, coiling to either side. Underneath the figure sometimes lay a conventionalized thunderbolt. Now who was Abraxas? His name in accordance with Kabbalistic computation is decoded to mean 365 isn't it absolutely incredible that every single time we investigate one of these, it leads directly to the sun? For 365 days, or the number of days in the year, or the exact number of days that it takes the earth to make one revolution around the sun. Amazing. There was no god or idol belonging to the society. And this is where man made the transition from worshiping a god to worshiping the mind. The Abraxas figure merely represented the aspects of power which went to make up the supreme intelligence, the all-power. 
The body was man himself. The bird stood for intelligence and the hailing of light, illumination, which is the cock's habit at dawn. The tunic represented the need for struggle or revolution, socialism. The arms, the protection and power given by the dedication to the Gnosis or knowledge. The shield was wisdom. The club or whip, power. The two snakes, noose, insight and logos, understanding, primordial knowing, which was the gift from Satan, the snake, the serpent. By means of this diagram, Gnostic teachers inculcated the theory that man comes to his full power by developing certain facets of his mind. He must struggle to arrive at Gnosis. But this knowledge is of the mystical kind and is not the mere collection of facts. You see, great stress was laid upon personal mystical experience to and through which the initiate was guided under conditions of great secrecy. The Gnostics did not confine their studies or their teachings to any one religion, but borrowed illustrations from all that were accessible to them. This caused them to be considered Christians, heretics, Jews who were trying to undermine Christianity, remnants of the Persian sun worshippers. They have been widely studied by early Christian sages, and it is upon the opinions of these latter that many conclusions have been formed. Little or no investigation of these, quote, people of wisdom, unquote, has been done by research workers on the spot in Asia and North Africa, where strong and interesting traces of their beliefs and practices still remain. The main teaching states that there is a supreme being or power which is invisible and has no perceptible form. It is pantheism. This power is the one which can be contacted by mankind and it is through it that man can control himself and work out his destiny. The various religious teachers through the ages, putting their creeds in many different ways, were in contact with this power they claim, and the religions all contain a more or less hidden kernel of initiation. Now, this is the secret which the knowers can communicate to their disciples. But the secret can be acquired only through exercising the mind and body until the terrestrial man is so refined as to be able to become a vehicle for the use of this power, or, in their terms, illumined. Eventually, the initiate becomes identified with the power, and in the end he attains his true destiny as purified personality, infinitely superior to the rest of unenlightened mankind to the state of apotheosis where he himself is God. The symbolism in which this teaching is concealed, the methods by which the mystical power is attained, vary from one Gnostic society to another, but the constant factor is there the attainment of that which humankind unconsciously needs. You see, the Gnostic claims that within every man and woman there is an unfulfilled urge which cannot be given any proper expression in the normal way because there is no social means by which it can be fulfilled. This feeling has been put into man in order that he may seek the fulfillment which the Gnostics can give him. His search for completeness in love trade, professions, theology, is vain and unsuccessful. The theories of the various schools, folks, of Gnosticism with which the Christian clerics came into contact are very much secondary to the rituals and practices which are used to produce the Gnosis, the Enlightenment, the Illumination. This has not been fully understood by too many people who devote much space in trying to work out the beliefs of the knowers by a perusal of their writings or by reports which have been given them by others, simply, folks, because they do not understand the symbolism. It is not clear to them. It is veiled. It is the esoteric wisdom. What were and are the Gnostic practices? Well, first, discipleship and the inculcated belief that the initiate must struggle, must devote himself as much as possible to the identification with the power which inspires all. 
Secondly, there are two kinds of men. Those who are bound to the earth and to matter, and those who can refine themselves. It is from the latter class that aspirants are chosen. They claim. In every instance that we've investigated, they may choose them from the latter class, but they all end up in the first. Thirdly, the methods by which the divine illumination may come are many and varied, and it is the province of the teacher to choose which path he will give to his disciple to follow. Some Gnostics believe that frenzy and excitement would produce the necessary liberation of the mind from the fetters of the body. Remember the Sphinx? Others consider that this could be done best by fasting and meditation. Present-day Gnostic practice in the East has it that different methods suit different temperaments. And this could be one cause for the historical confusion as to which branch of heretics practice what. The Gnostics believed themselves to be intellectual aristocrats. Their knowledge was only for the few who were ready to receive it, and that's why they do not recruit. You must knock at the door, and you and only you know when you're ready to receive it. And this is what made them a secret cult, not the fear of persecution. They had their own passwords and shaking hands. They tickled the palm as an identification signal, and they helped one another in every conceivable way, just as Freemasons do today, for they are one and the same, as they have always been one and the same with all the different versions of the mystery throughout the ages. Now, some say that they could not be called pantheists because they considered that the doctrine was secondary to the experience of religion, and the theologians and ordinary priesthood of any religion did not approve of that. They were not, in fact, a religion like most others, because they stressed the importance of the individual before that of the community. Those who were more enlightened were more important in every possible way because they were valuable, refined aristocrats. At the same time, they taught that providing the well-being of the Gnostics was assured. So was that of the community at large. And this meant that they could subscribe to the outward doctrines of any religion and could continue to operate under many different political religious systems. Gnosticism profoundly influenced men's minds, even in Europe, up to and after the Middle Ages, and its basic way of thinking is probably an underlying factor in other secret societies whose members would be surprised to know it because the pyramidal organizational structure of the membership of these organizations means that nobody below the top, the very top, really knows anything of the true religion and goals of the society to which they belong. And so these people could truly be said to be the greatest group of followers and fools in the history of the world. For they think that they are illumined, but in fact, they are never given any real secrets, and only those at the top truly know what is really going on. Terrible obscenities, and other crimes have been laid at the door of the Gnostics by the early ecclesiastical writers, although there is little doubt that some of them did believe in mass ecstasy. It seems unlikely that their secrets were well enough known to enable the commentators to assess them, and in most cases, whenever the commentators tried to assess them, they were assessing the exoteric, or the appearance, but not the esoteric are the real truths of the object, of the worship of the Gnostics. The belief that certain special men could control their destiny and obtain extra powers through dedication to Gnostic practices meant that inevitably there was a belief in magic. Remember on previous shows we discussed that belief in magic? Magic is real, folks. I have seen it work. It is not to be played with or laughed at or scoffed about. It is dangerous, extremely dangerous. 
The Meyer agnostic gems are inscribed stones decorated with serpents, Kabbalistic names and the rest are more likely to be proofs of initiation and talismans than mere identification tokens presented to ensure admission to meetings, as some authors have thought. The reason for supposing this is that, one, the gems are very similar in many respects to talismans in use by other communities, including the Egyptians, and two, they can often be interpreted as containing magical messages or diagrammatical invocations. Ethically speaking, Gnostic belief is that there are two principles, that of good and evil. A balance must be struck between these forces, and the balance is in the hands of the Gnostic, the knower, partly because nobody else can tell whether an action is for the eventual good of the individual or the community. And this secret knowledge comes through the mystical insight which the supermen Gnostics attained. There's that reference to a super race or a superman again which always crops up with these people as it did with Hitler and many others. The rise of individuals who wrongly believed that they had attained to gnosis, all knowledge, some of whom were leaders of Gnostic societies, produced very notorious characters. Those who followed the way of the Ophite branch glorified the serpent who tempted Eve and they still do that today. They did this because this snake, by his actions, brought knowledge into the world, gave man the gift of intellect, the use of which will bring him to the state of apotheosis, where man himself will be God. Basilides was a leader who taught that Jesus did not die on the cross, and you will see this crop up all through the history of the mystery schools, even in the Knights Templar. Since matter and material things were considered to be a part of the inferior non-spiritual world, the sect known as the Canaanites called upon everyone to destroy those things, and they call themselves the destroyers, and their god is the destroyer. These deviations and aberrants have attracted the greatest attention, as is natural, and the quieter teachers of the creed have received less attention. The pious horror with which the less respectable Gnostics were viewed by the early Christian fathers has stamped itself forever on Western literature and belief about the, quote, enlightened ones, unquote. But in more than one place in the Middle East, as well as in small groups in Western Europe, there are still followers of various schools of Gnosticism, they mainly follow the ideas held by Valentinus, with some variations. And this school teaches its initiates that matter is more evil than good, that man must be purified by mental concentration, that after death man will rejoin that from which he has been severed and will be unified with those whom he loves in the great intelligence. They also believe that all matter will eventually be destroyed by fire. And if they have their way, that could be absolutely true. The Mandeans, a small but tenacious community which dwells in Iraq, follow an ancient form of Gnosticism, which practices initiation, ecstasy, and some rituals which have been said to resemble those of the Freemasons, and of course they do, because they are. <laughs> In every Masonic temple you will see somewhere up on the wall a big letter G, and you will see it in their symbology, in their books. You will see this letter G. And if you ask a Freemason, being bound to the oath never to tell you or reveal the secrets, to the profane, which is what they call those who are not initiates or adepts in the mysteries. He will tell you that it stands for God, but that is a lie. It does not stand for God, for I have researched it deeply all the way up the ladder of the stages of initiation. And at the top, those adepts known as the priesthood know this large letter G to represent Gnosticism, 
and it is an admission that they are indeed the recipients of the ancient Gnostic. They are Gnostics, and they are looking to attain the Gnosis, through which they will receive apotheosis. And they believe that they are the only ones in the world who possess truly mature minds, and thus are the only ones in the world capable of ruling the rest of us, whom they refer to as cattle. Cattle. Well, it's time to take a break, folks. Don't go away. I'll be right back after this very short pause. 